This is the second in a two-part video about High Vision Laserdisc. This was the first, I suppose you could say, the original way to buy high-definition movies on an optical disc, and it happened 25 years ago. In part one, I talked about the history, the ideas and technology that went into making it possible, went into some of the problems and costs of getting everything together to make this video, and took a look at the titles that were available at the time. There's a link to part one in the video description text box. In this concluding part, we'll get to take a look at High Vision Laserdisc in action, and I'll talk about some of its limitations, but first, I'll need to set everything up. When compared against a standard Laserdisc player, the Pioneer HLD X9 dwarfs it, not just in overall dimensions, but in weight as well. My standard player weighs 6.7 kilograms, the High Vision one 17 kilograms, approximately two and a half times as much. This was a premium product, and the build quality is impressive. No doubt it needs some of that extra weight, though, to help dampen down the vibrations of the High Vision disc spinning at 2,700 RPM. And it works. Overall, it's the quietest Laserdisc player that I've used. If we take a look around the back of the machine, you'll see that quite a few of the outputs are duplicated to make it more convenient to connect up with AV systems. However, when it comes to playing high vision discs, you only need to use one wire to connect the player to the decoder. This cable carries the video and audio in the form of a Muse signal, and then it's the decoder's job to convert that signal into video and audio that the TV can use. The HD video is sent out over component leads and the audio via standard RCA cables. These dip switches on the back of the decoder configure various functions. Putting switch number two in the down position will down mix the four channel audio into the two channel stereo signal that I'll be using for this demonstration. Now, if you were attaching this to an AV amp, you'd need to have discrete inputs for those other two outlets on there for the front, center, and rear surround, but I'm just gonna use the stereo this time. There are quite a few other unused sockets on here, though. Those are for if I was attaching up a satellite receiver, which would receive the Muse signal, and of course this would decode it, and if I had a WVHS recorder, which again could record that satellite signal and would need to go through the decoder before the signal could be shown on the television. It could also play normal VHS tape as well and of course there's quite a few pass-throughs for that. There's one other socket I could use on the back of here though, it's this power outlet because I can put my laser disc power into this and therefore only have to use the one cable to power both the decoder and the laser disc player. So with the setup that I've got here, all I've got coming out of the decoder is stereo, RCA and component. So I'll plug those into this 22 inch 1080p TV that I use for testing. Reading the articles from the early to mid 90s though, it seems like a common size of a high vision TV back then was 32 inches. And of course that used a CRT screen. So it's good to bear that in mind that they didn't really have our modern 65 inch OLED TVs in mind when they were coming up with this format. Once the Laserdisc gets up to speed, the decoder immediately recognises that it's receiving a Muse signal, so it then decodes it and sends a video off to the screen. And as soon as it appears, it's immediately obvious that the quality is a big step up from standard Laserdisc. At the time, this was the best home video quality most people had seen, and many people wouldn't see anything better than this for another decade. Now, rather than just shooting a TV screen, I wanted to show you some video that I've captured from High Vision. So it's been taken from this disc, and to capture it, I used an Elgato Game Capture HD. As well as accepting HDMI, this device can capture analog sources, and depending upon the cable that you use, it will record composite, S-video or component. So for this demonstration, I've captured high vision via component, and I captured the standard Laserdisc version for comparison via S-video, and both discs were played back on the same machine, the Pioneer HLD X9. Okay, so first up, normal Laserdisc. Now this is straight out of the S-Video output on the X9, no processing, colour correction, or anything's been applied to it. This is it. Now this particular disc has an open matte version of the movie on it, and while the later widescreen Laserdisc releases might well have a better transfer, this is the one that I've got. Okay, now next up, the high vision version. Now this is a 69 matte of the open frame version we saw before. 
it's a completely different kettle of fish as far as the image quality goes though if i was being critical i could perhaps say that it was a touch oversaturated maybe a little bit dark in places but all things considered i'd much rather watch this one than the other one now when i put them side by side here you can really see how washed out and indistinct the standard laser disc is when compared against the high vision one but don't just look at the contrast and the color and the brightness look for the detail in the background i picked a couple of daytime scenes here lots of things going on lots of sharp detail to look at if it's present and notice also how the subtitles are quite a bit smaller on the high vision version as well that's because of the sharper display you can make smaller text and it's still readable on a standard size screen also i should point out that the laser disc i'm using is quite an early version of back to the future on laser disc from japan it's the only edition that i've got that i can compare against the high vision ones so that's the one i'm using i think there were probably better transfers on later laser discs that would also of course been widescreen although they would have been matted off so they wouldn't have had any more resolution than this one i've matted the top and bottom to match it up with the other one on the screen here and of course if you had for laser disc player you'd adjust the brightness the contrast the color and all those settings in your television to get it looking as good as possible what i've got here is just the video coming straight out of the back of the laser disc player through that s video socket into that capture device so i haven't been able to do any kind of manipulation with it on these particular shots but i just wanted to show you what the raw footage looked like from both formats side by side but when you compare high vision against blu-ray you can see how far it falls behind what we expect nowadays of a movie in 1080p although it's hard to say how much of this difference is down to the muse and the high vision system itself and how much is down to the capture that i'm doing over an analog component video source it's quite possible also that a lot of the improvement you see on the blu-ray version is as a result of advances that have been made over the last couple of decades in transferring film to video for example, you can see that there's a very obvious blurring that originates from the optical nature of the high vision transfer. The geometry of the image is deformed. It feels very much like an eye test where they say, is this lens better or that lens better? Is it A or is it B? A or B? It's more than likely if high vision laser disc was still around, then the quality of these transfers on the old discs wouldn't be a patch on the latest ones. But still, back in the mid 90s, this really was as good as it got. The Muse compression system used a lot of tricks to enable it to get the full high vision video down so it could fit onto a laser disc. One of the things it did was that it was a four field interlay system, meaning that it took four frames to make up a full image. So therefore static images get shown at their full resolution, but when things start to move, they get a little bit blurry. Now, one of the tricks they used to compress the video down further was the fact that a moving object across a screen tends to look blurry anyway. So they show that at a lower resolution than the rest of the image. However, if you're technically minded and you want to know more, I'd suggest just look up multiple Subnyquist sampling encoding online. You'll find some very detailed explanations telling you how the video signal gets broken up by discrete time sampling into frequency bands which are manipulated separately, how full frame pans are compensated by encoding motion vectors and how moving objects are low pass filtered line offset subsampled while color components are low pass filtered vertically alternated and time compressed but long story short it was a very clever system for its time and surprisingly effective I was trying to see if I could show any of the Muse compression artifacts, and I think I might have got some here. As the arm moves, you can see it gets really quite blurry, and I think that's as a result of that four field interlacing. However, this really is just pixel peeping, because if you play this scene at its normal speed, that really just isn't noticeable. Apparently these motion artifacts were significantly reduced by a new Muse encoder and decoder that was introduced in 1996. According to Wikipedia, you can see the results of this Muse 3 system in action on one of the last of the high vision laser discs called The River. However, according to the much more reliable LaserDisc database, there's no disc called The River. The nearest thing we've got on here is A River Runs Through It, but that was from 1994, which is two years before this improved Muse system was introduced. Okay, now in trying to anticipate a few questions, I'm sure someone will be wondering what the Muse signal sounds like. So for that person, here you go.
Next, I'm going to guess that someone will ask, what happens if you put a Muse Laserdisc in a normal Laserdisc player? Well, the obvious answer is not a lot. But if you want to see what not a lot looks like, then here you are. It doesn't play. It comes up with a P5 error, the same as if you put in any other type of disc that it was unable to read. So to round up this high vision demonstration section, I'd say that while it's an interesting piece of history, it doesn't really make any sense to get into it now. The movies are all available in HD on other formats and without hard-coded Japanese subtitles and in better quality. So rather than paying 700 euros for Back to the Future on high vision disc, why not just get the whole trilogy on Blu-ray for under £10? So moving away from high vision for a moment, let's just talk about using this player to play back normal NTSC laser discs. First, forget about using that Muse decoder. That can only take the Muse output from a high vision player. It's not an upscaler. You can't use it to watch standard laser discs over component. When it comes to normal laser discs, it's completely out of the loop. So to watch laser discs, you'll need an entirely new set of connections that come from the player itself. As far as the video goes, well, you've got a choice between composite and S-video outputs. And then for the audio, the digital side, well, you've got optical, you've got coax. And when it comes to the Dolby Digital AC3, well, you've got an RF output that comes from the back of here, but then you'll need to send that through an RF demodulator before you can put it into a modern AV amp to play the Dolby Digital soundtrack. And if you've got any laser discs that just have analog audio, then you'll need to connect up these RCA stereo outputs as well. Right, so with everything connected up, I should quickly mention that the remote control that comes with this player is suitably high-end. As well as the familiar jog shuttle dial arrangement, it's also equipped with a backlight for the transport buttons. It's very similar in layout to the remote for my other machine, but it's got a couple of additional buttons for the variable digital noise reduction features. Because although the video on a standard Laserdisc is composite, this player is recognised as having a particularly good comb filter, so the output over S-Video is noticeably improved. To see how good it is, I got hold of an NTSC demo disc from Mitsubishi. This is the kind of thing that would have been used to demonstrate the superior quality of Laserdisc in a showroom environment. The sleeve goes into great detail about how the production process went above and beyond to create the very best demo footage. But yet again, on my television, it just looked washed out, and the various picture modes just made it look weird rather than better. Now, part of the problem is, like most modern televisions, this doesn't have a separate S-Video input, or even one that's embedded into that SCART connection. Now, apologies for this out-of-focus section, but it's the only time I managed to capture these screens that show the various settings available for the S-Video output picture enhancements. To test out the effectiveness of these, I put my modern flat panel TV away and broke out my old CRT broadcast monitor that does have a dedicated S-Video input. Once I've got it wired up, I press play on the Laserdisc and this popped up. Yes, it's that P5 error again, and no matter what I did, it refused to play any more discs, whether standard or high definition. So there you go, that's all I've got to show you. The machine died and I'm in two minds whether to go and get it repaired because I've got the feeling this is that kind of early 90s overly complicated electronics that you repair one thing and then something else dies afterwards. It might just be time to cut my losses on this. Now if I had been able to continue making the video with a working machine, I did have plans to watch the movies all the way through and then pass judgment on what I thought of them, whether they were still watchable in this format or whether the artifacts um, were too distracting and whether it's better just to watch a DVD even than this. And then I was also planning on trying to play some of my old laser discs, the ones that I've noticed have got a bit of laser rot on them with lots of speckled marks because apparently these high vision players with their different lasers are, are better able to read those discs, but that's something I won't be able to try out now. And after I'd finished making the video, this was going to be my laser disc player that replaced the other one I've got underneath the television. It was going to go in the cabinet, but given its size, I was looking at taking the doors off and things, so I suppose that's one less thing for me to worry about. But uh, I hope you've enjoyed seeing this here in action for the brief period of time it was working. And if you have enjoyed it, perhaps consider subscribing if you haven't already. And if you want, you can always go on Patreon and help support the next ludicrously ridiculous, over-expensive folly of an idea. But that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching. <laughs>